I do think that there is a demand for crazy on the internet. Listen, women are getting pregnant every day in America. Build back better, blah, blah, blah. They said, you have no authority. You're not the president. The president said, I said, call him. No, screw your freedom. They're a bunch of dumb shits. No offense. Don't hate the media. They come to me. Talk about manufacturing reality. To find out more, fuck around. That's right. That is right. Uh, the Yona always laying down the uh, the FAFO principle. And uh, welcome back to your Liberty Radio, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I may look subdued, but I am 100% fired up for this round of open lines. Uh, we are back on a Friday night. It is March 1st, 2024. I am the Drizzle, and I am here to take your phone calls tonight and find out what is on your mind here on this March 1st, which also happens to be the first day of Women's History Month, according to Google. So, uh, you know, we may have to fact check them, but that is what my Google calendar said. We transition from Black History Month to Women's History Month. And uh, we probably don't even have to skip a beat with the decorations, I'm assuming. It's also, uh, again, for those scoring along at home, it is also the 51st anniversary of the release of an album known as Dark Side of the Moon was released by Pink Floyd back on March 1st, 1973. It's actually a year and a half almost older than me. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. And of course, who can forget, on this day, March 1st, in history, uh, matter of fact, in, in 1780, Pennsylvania became the first state to abolish slavery, but it was for uh, newborns only. So anybody that was already in existence at that time, nah, you were screwed. The government screwed you uh, once again when, uh, when Pennsylvania became the first state to officially abolish slavery. They were only thinking of the unborn. They didn't care about the rest of you. Uh, so that should, I mean, that's a pattern that pretty much repeated uh, throughout the rest of history. As far as I can tell, uh, I don't know. Again, your results may vary if you are scoring along at home. Yeah, we're done with that one. So we'll send it on its way. Uh, it is Friday night, ladies and gentlemen, the night where we open up the phone lines so that you guys can call in and let us know what is on your mind. We are here for you tonight. We are here to listen, not so much to, to do the talky part. That's for you guys. And uh, whatever, whatever is on your mind, it doesn't matter if it would be censored by some other platform. We don't care. That's not how we operate here on Open Lines. It's whatever you feel like talking about. We're willing to talk about it with you because that's how we actually move things forward as a species. We have discussions about ideas and we figure out which the best ideas are. And it actually works best when we can have as many people giving their input on those ideas because Lo and behold, 
not everybody sees everything exactly the same way. Society is not homogenous. Never has been, as far as I can tell, never will be, despite the best efforts uh, of the parasite class. And for those of you in the listening audience uh, that might be a little bit on the, on the shy side, uh, I was there for a while myself. I know it's probably hard to believe, uh, but it did happen even going from starting as someone who liked to have the spotlight on them. Uh, I did transition to a point where I just didn't want to talk to anybody about anything. And now I, of course, come back full circle uh, to having the spotlight on me again. I just don't really pay attention to what people say at this point. But you, if you happen to be on the shy side, you don't have to turn your camera on to call into open lines. It's not, we don't have rules here. This is, this is not a government facility where you have to constantly cross your I's and dot your T's. No. It's, it's however you want to do it. It's free form. It's Friday night open lines. That's what we're here for. The Zoom link, the call-in link, is in the Liberty Radio Telegram channel right now. And uh, that's it. That's how you dial in. Curious thing is, let's see. All right, the internet is working. That's good. Always have to check, you know, in COVID land in 2024 because could be here right now and gone the next minute. That's, that's just how connectivity seems to be working these days since we entered COVID land. Didn't have these problems in the before times. Uh, but again, some people say that my memory is a little bit faulty. That's fair. That's fair criticism. So this is a golden opportunity for someone, if you have never called in to open lines before, but you've been thinking about doing it, you definitely want to get in now before the Yona shows up. Because the Yona is going to dominate the conversation no matter what we're talking about. Uh, the Yona knows, the Yona has forgotten more uh, about the world than many of the children today will ever learn. And I can say that in all confidence because I have interacted with the children today. I've also interacted with the Yona. Uh, so I base all of this on my own lived experience, which means you can't challenge it in this brave new world. So anyway. Uh, the Zoom link is in the Liberty Radio Telegram channel. Uh, call in and let us know what is on your mind. I think we might start out this evening uh, with, uh, well, I've been, I've been holding on to this one for a while, right? I stumbled across this on Odyssey, I guess it was maybe about a week and a half ago. And I was like, oh, I need to watch this. And then I thought, oh, maybe I can use this as content because <clears throat> that's how the, the game is played, right? You use other people's content as your content and you, you make money off of it. It's called a grift. Anyway, I've been sitting on this for a while. Uh, so maybe this is how we will get things started tonight on open lines. And that'll give you guys a chance uh, to hit up the link in the Liberty Radio Telegram channel. This, of course, uh, was the article that we covered in the pre-show. Uh, and for those of you who are only watching the replay, uh, we've already been at this for more than an hour now. Uh, we played some music. Uh, we covered a newsy item that people might want to know about. And, you know, we've just been hanging out, having a good time. Because it's Friday. Fuck it. So, somehow or another, uh, I am still subscribed to the Dark Horse podcast on Odyssey. Uh, and specifically the Clips channel. And this just so happened to, to cross my radar one day when I had Odyssey pulled up. So what we are about to uh, view here 
is Brett Weinstein, the host, or I guess one of the hosts, technically, of the Dark Horse podcast, answering the question, is Dark Horse a limited hangout? Which, to me, sounds like a yes or no question, right? But it takes him 10 minutes to answer this apparent yes or no question. Let's check it out. Collusion. Oh, I'm no, avoiding oh, the word. No, no, no. Go back to the beginning. We don't know how to deal with collusion. I'm avoiding the word conspiracy because it has so many bad connotations. But if we say collusion, collusion is conspiracy. And the problem is when people realize that they are living in an era where they need to think about collusion because it's actually not a minor fact of our environment, they do not understand that they have stepped into a realm where the philosophical toolkit, the scientific toolkit that they've been handed, now has a challenge that has to be addressed with extreme care. And the hazard is this. Boy, I was not expecting to go this deep into the philosophy. But let's take Occam's razor for a second. Occam's razor is the principle that um, the simplest explanation for a given set of observations tends to be correct. All else being equal. Right. All else being equal. And I would also say that the problem with Occam's razor is that it is simultaneously the fundamental principle of science, that the way we decide what is likely to be true, the way we update our models of the universe over time, is that we apply the principle of parsimony, right? There's a set of things that are facts, and whatever explanation we have that explains those facts, either by assuming less or explaining more, and hopefully both, whatever integrates the assumptions at the lowest level and the explanatory power at the highest level is the explanation. It's our, it's our working model. And my argument is that actually Occam's razor, simplest explanation tends to be true, could be rephrased as given all of the evidence, the simplest explanation is always true. If you had Every, if you if you had <clears throat> yeah. infinite information about every observation from every side, then the simplest explanation that explained all of it with the least assumptions would always be right. And we so never you land did. on when 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 you find yourself in possession of evidence of conspiracy, for instance, or collusion, uh, and if you turn out to be correct, part of what you have discovered is uh, that you knew less about the system than you thought. Right. And so the example that makes this perfectly clear is the process of framing, right? If we say, you know, uh, Ned was convicted of murder, and then somebody says, yeah, but he was framed, mm. right? What they are alleging is that the reason that the evidence led the court to convict him was that somebody organized the evidence so it would point to this guy, yeah. right? So if we take this example, what the court saw, the simplest explanation is that Ned committed the crime, mm -hmm. right? If the court had had access to the fact that there was a meeting of people, and at that meeting, a transcript of the meeting would reflect, well, how are we going to arrange the evidence so that the cops pick up Ned and he's then convicted? Mm -hmm. If you knew that that meeting had happened, then the point is, oh, well, in light of that evidence, the simplest explanation is that Ned was being railroaded for some purpose, mm -hmm. right? So, okay. In the universe, if you had all the evidence, then Occam's razor could be phrased much more strongly and it would be a law, not just a principle. Mm -hmm. But we never have all the evidence. So at the point that we are talking about collusion, we are inherently talking about some analog of framing, right? Collusion always involves the evidence leading you to a wrong conclusion. So that point is I'm going to deny you the evidence of our meeting and I'm going to leave you with the evidence of X, Y, and Z. And given that you have a bias and you can see this evidence and you don't know the evidence you can't see, you're going to reach a wrong conclusion. That's what collusion does, right? So at the point that you come to the conclusion, right or wrong, that collusion may be an important feature of the environment that you're operating in, you have to become suspect 
of Occam's razor? Because the question is, well, why is that the simplest answer? Is that the simplest answer because mm -hmm. it's really the simplest answer? Or is it the simplest answer because I'm standing where I'm expected to stand and I'm processing the information that I'm expected to look at? Okay. So, okay, that's great. So now you've got people who are interested in collusion who are aware that Occam's razor may be misleading them. Occam's razor as it is phrased, not as it is actually true in the universe with all the evidence available. So what do those people do? Well, what they do is they turn down their dependence, their reliance on Occam's razor, which is the correct thing to do if you don't have all of the evidence and you want not to be fooled by those who would collude against you. You get more uh, creative in allowing your brain to make connections between things. 100%. You yep. free yourself from the normal rules of logic in order so that you could see what might be going on. And there's nothing wrong with that. That is actually necessary. However, you cannot then decide that the quality of your thinking is as it would be if you were in a laboratory where you controlled all of the inputs and you knew that the lab bench wasn't conspiring against you. So the point is... you The, the bench itself. I mean, you know, in a, in a universe where the bench conspires against you, then you can't rely on the fact that the contents of the test tubes are really telling you anything because it may be that the bench is tricking you using the test tubes somehow. But that's not how it works. In the yep. world of people, we mislead each other. And so, um, yes, you have to relax mm -hmm. your standards in order to think about collusion. No, you don't get the same level of strength of conclusion out of it. You have to be more careful Mm -hmm. Than regular folks doing regular work on, you know, if you go into the field and you study the behavior of frogs as you did, mm -hmm. right, you don't have to worry that somebody is arranging the frogs because what would have to be true, A, why would anybody want to trick you through frogs and B, what would they have to act, you'd, you, you'd see them arranging the frogs before you got to your <laughs> study site. So you can just assume the frogs are probably doing whatever the frogs do. Nobody's trying to trick me, mm -hmm. right? But the realms where that's not true, you have to relax your standards, but you also have to treat mm -hmm. your conclusions with a kind of skepticism that is very rare amongst those who actually think about this stuff. I now am the subject of many a hypothesis of collusion. You can be pretty sure they're not true. You can't be as sure as I can be, but you Interesting place to cut where he now gets to uh, make his case. Uh, for why uh, Dark Horse is not a limited hangout. I imagine, I imagine that's what's about to happen. I'm just, I'm just free associating here. That, that you aren't involved? Right. In, yeah. Right. Yeah. But in terms of people who don't know us, haven't known us for years, who just come across us on the internet, right? They don't know, right? No, and nor should they. I mean, right. we, we have to just, just as... We say to everyone, I always said to our students, we have to earn your trust. Right. You do not simply trust us because we have the right credentials. Certainly not because we've seen that abused for hundreds totally. of years. So my point is, look, I am in a great position to watch the behavior of the people who are doing this work in public mm -hmm. because they're talking about me and I can be certain of whether things that they land on are true or not mm -hmm. in many cases. Right. So the point is, oh, well. hold up. Uh, how can, why is he in such a unique position to determine uh, what is true and what is not, where any other individual is of lesser quality in that respect? Well, Brett's one of the new gatekeepers, and he's part of a network of cross promoters that the mainstream blah, blah, blah. Oh, I see. I see what's going on here. Okay, he's taking a shot at Amazing Polly. That's what's going on. I was using to X, Y, and Z. And it's like, well, okay, let's start at the bottom of that tree of uh, uh, that tree of contingencies. One of two things has to be true. Either the allegation is that I am knowingly part of such an entity, mm -hmm. in which case I would know it. You would. And right. you on the internet can't know for sure that I'm not lying to you, but I can know. Right. that your accusation is inaccurate. And so mm -hmm. I can say, oh, this person is sloppy because they've landed on a conclusion that they're certain of, and I know it's wrong. But uh, the argument will come back, and this was the alternative to you might know it, maybe you don't know it. Maybe you're part of this uh, this vast conspiratorial network of uh, future orthodox agents, and you just don't know it. Unwitting. 
Now, <laughs> if I'm an unwitting agent of these people, well, I can't be certain that's not true. But then again, it means nothing. Because mm -hmm. the point is, we know we live in a world full of propaganda, which is people trying to persuade us of things that aren't true, mm -hmm. so that we will, you know, mouth off on Twitter about them or whatever. So the point is, okay, either this is an empty accusation, or it's a wrong accusation. If it's, you know, you're, you're an agent of Goliath, and you don't know it, well, yeah, okay, maybe, but you might also be. Um, if it's you are a witting agent of Goliath, then the answer is, well, I know you're not going to take my word for it, but no, your your logic is sloppy. If you say Brett is a limited hangout, what that means is that somebody, in an effort to prevent people from waking up, is going to provide you with something that contains shocking elements of the truth, but that there's a cap on how deep the truth goes, right? So you could imagine that there's some job in which... What you do is you present a sanitized version of the truth that prevents the really explosive stuff from emerging. Now, on the one hand, do I believe that limited hangouts exist? Of course I do. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think that this has been an important feature of our landscape since the Kennedy assassination, at least, where we see... Lots and lots of exploration of the nonsense that's obvious in the story of that assassination that contains elements of the truth fused to elements that are nonsense. And so the point is, it prevents us from ever reaching resolution on what actually happened. So yeah, limited hangouts exist. Again, either limited hangout means you know that that's what you are, or it means nothing because it means that somebody has, you know, let you see part of the truth, but they're still obscuring something else, which is almost undoubtedly true for all of us. So if it means something, you know, Brett's a limited hangout, and then Brett would know that he was a limited hangout, then I also know that this is wrong. But then it allows me to go and look at what happens in the context of somebody leveling this accusation. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens is they now have a model that has built into it an immunity to falsification. It's not just a verificationism, mm -hmm. but it has an immunity to falsification because anything <clears throat> I say that's <clears throat> shocking and seems to go against Goliath's interests, oh, well, he's a limited hangout. I told you that. Mm. Yeah, and of course he's going he's gonna to give you the shocking stuff. That's how he gets you to join his audience, and then it limits what you can see because now that you're listening to him, you're not going to get the real stuff, right, which only we real people are trafficking in, right? So the point is, okay, well, you've now built... It's so tiring. <laughs> yeah, it's tiring, but it's also fascinating, and it is um, it is interesting to be on the side of it where you actually know for sure that it's you don't have to worry, as we do with other people, about whether they really are a limited hangout, because in my case, I'm just in a position to say, nope. Okay, so, so you heard it uh, from the horse's mouth uh, himself. Uh, Brett Weinstein is not a limited hangout, all right? So you can just cut it out, all you dirty conspiracy theorists who think that Brett's, Brett's part of some cabal that's trying to take over the world and institute a one-world government, he's in a position to know that that's not true, all right? So y'all can just quit it, knock it off, uh, and and go away, you dirty little trolls. What do you think about that, Maddie? Oh, hold on. I need to yeah. hit that hey, can button. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. All right, gotcha. I had you muted. Yeah, I, <laughs> um, I mean, that's a really long-winded answer to say that it's it's difficult to prove a negative, so... You know, that's why the standard of, of, of criminal prosecution, in this, at least in this country, is you have to prove that somebody beyond a reasonable doubt did do something that not that they didn't do something. So uh, that that's fine. Like, that's fine by me. But uh, it, it's not really satisfactory. And I think that's that's what he's kind of alluding to. Like, you can't he can say, oh, I know that I'm not part of some thing, whatever. Right. Uh, right. Which which logical fallacy would that be? Uh, ad ignorantium fallacy. So yeah. you can't, you know, the negative holds the field if there's uncertainty or doubt. Like, 
um, it's best on the to err on the side of no, uh, something isn't the case rather than that is, um, if you have no di direct evidence of it. But the problem is, you know, and this is the case for uh, many, many, at least many crimes, uh, is that there are circumstantial evidence and circumstantial evidence is, is oftentimes enough uh, when there is no direct evidence. Uh, and that's left to the jury of your peers, like a jury of your peers. So maybe he's facing the court of public opinion right now and maybe they'll, they'll find, I mean, that's, that's the way human, human, uh, human things go. <laughs> yeah. We can't know. He can know. Sure. Uh, and we have to use our best judgment. Right. Based on the evidence we have. So. Well, I, I also find it just a little bit disingenuous that he, because the, the whole time while I was listening to him and I'm sure I was, I was making some very entertaining faces, but I, I felt like a, uh, like a petulant teenager, right? Like I was being talked down to, uh, because I was just, I was just going crazy with my imagination and thinking things that just aren't true. And, and I need to, I need to grow up because, you know, adults run the world, not crazy, petulant teenagers. Yeah. I mean, it, it is a little bit of like, you're being silly. Yeah. Stop being silly. <laughs> you have your, your imagination's running a little wild. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I find it hard to feel like, uh, these these guys on the internet are talking down to me because I mean they're just sitting in in a room you know they're they're on the internet saying stuff so like <laughs> I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I know, mean we but... could we could definitely spend some time uh, ripping on his uh, set design and and motif selection because again I I'm starting to call him Professor Mistoph Mephistopheles because that's what he looks like when he's on that set. It's everything's red. And he's like mm -hmm. lit from above, so it creates all these <laughs> weird shadows on his face. Like it just looks demonic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, uh, who, did his <laughs> did his wife have no input on this whatsoever? <laughs> it's like Brett. Are you trying to go for the most evil, uh, you know, just like design that you possibly can? Yeah, they didn't. They didn't consult a, like a, a a design or like a set book uh manual or anything like that <laughs> well and he's had it that way I don't know for so of, long like I, i'm sure i'm not the yeah. only person that's had this criticism of it right i'm sure at some point no. it has gotten back to him that people are like you might you might want to like change up the background and like not wear red all the time hey maybe it's his favorite color it's my favorite color but obviously i'm not in like a <laughs> all red room uh uh, that's good. You know, have you ever read Amityville Horror? I haven't read it, but I've seen the movie, which I know is not the same oh, thing. Okay. No, no. Yeah, well, I mean, it, I don't know if it's in the movie or not, but there's like a a uh, infamous red room, um, in the in the basement. It's kind of it's kind of like that. <laughs> wow. But uh, anyway. So what's on your mind tonight? You just you dropped in like right in the middle of that. Yeah, not not much. Um, just minding my own business, and I uh, yeah, not much. I'm starting my garden, and I'm selling eggs. Oh, nice. So that that's about as exciting as my life gets. <laughs> so what are you what are you planning to plant this year? Um, a lot of stuff: potatoes, onions, strawberries. Lettuces, uh, leeks, uh, tomatoes, obviously, herbs. What else? Like I, I have like I don't know, two hundred seedlings right now started. So, and that's only like the first half. But we're trying to eat as much of our own stuff as possible because it really is like difficult to find organic stuff. And I'm not, I don't trust that these stuff and even the organic stuff, you know, in, in the stores are, are free of a lot of stuff. Cause once you get into like the ag communities around you, at least here, 
you learn about all the stuff they they spray on everything um and i was at a winery the other day doing like learning how to prune grapevines and i asked them how they deal with some fungus issues and they're like oh yeah we spray like by every five to seven days and people are drinking like you know bottles of these wines all at once wow it's just nuts yeah so well you know i just saw maybe two hours ago uh, when I was uh, just trying to pass a little time before we went on the air. Uh, apparently, Bear has just won uh, a lawsuit against them for uh, Roundup. So all oh, right. the people yeah, who right. suffered and got cancer and, yeah, suffered horrible results uh, as a result of using their product. Um, yeah, Judge said Bear is not liable. Yeah. That's nice. Isn't that awesome? Free cancer. Yeah. Free cancer with your corn pops. <laughs> <laughs> corn pop and cancer cereal. Yeah. It's the American um, it's way. It's really bad. It's really bad. Uh, but also at the same time, I feel kind of like a punk for having a garden because, you know, now they're saying that gardens are are contributing so much to climate change and they're oh, so bad right. for, the, for the earth and all that. Yeah. Oh, you're a dirty criminal now. Yep. Yep. And I'm working out and, you know, I'm like, oh, you know, Rishi Sunak, uh, I think today, uh, uh, analogized Islamic extremists with far right people. And, you know, the far right is, are the people who work out and have gardens and, and like have families and stuff that stick together. That's right. They're, they're also yeah. the ones that contribute the most carbon, uh, to climate change, which is why, uh, they have to be eliminated first. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'm like as bad as a, as a jihadist that, that, uh, you know, it just makes my day every, t- every time they say something like that. You know what you should like, do awesome. just to get like the, the maximum effect from it. Every time you plant a seedling scream, Alu Akbar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like a kamikaze in the soil. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, or like can something, you know, and pretend I'm making bombs um, with my pressure cooker. You know, I got this like giant pressure cooker um, and it is like it really could be. It, it is kind of scary. Like you, it has gaskets and like these, you know, wing nuts and stuff that hold the top on. It looks oh, like wow. it belongs in Sandia, you know, National Laboratory. <laughs> oh, so you're like you're cooking um, up some serious stuff then. Yeah, we're, I mean, we still have jars and jars and jars of a whole bunch of stuff, like roasted red peppers and pickles and tomatoes and all that. So, so are, hopefully the plan is to grow every, all the vegetables, right? And like create salsas and everything that you might need. Tomatoes, like I just ate the last jar of my tomato soup that I made in September, I think, today. Um, so that lasted all the way through the winter. Um, but if we can grow enough, you know, veggies and, and all that, um, and then all we have to buy is like the flowers, sugars, that kind of stuff. And then, you know, meats and cheeses, which we are already have like great farmers nearby that, uh, you know, are, are actually organic and treat their animals well. And that mm-hmm. the the government keeps trying to shut down. Like there's this famous one, Amos Miller. Yeah, I was going to ask been, you about that. Have you heard yeah, about that? He's yeah he he poor guy. You know, like they won't leave him alone. They they this is like I don't know how many times they've raided his farm, but they just are really trying to shut him down. Oh yeah, it's nuts. Well, last story I saw said that the government confiscated something like a hundred grand in uh, in product on that raid. Well, that- yeah, that and uh, not only that, but you have to consider that all the the you know the production stops and all those ingredients go bad. So they they yeah. they confiscated the goods, but they also stopped everything that he was going to make. So that's just a net loss there. And then he's not going to have any revenue from selling that. And he's probably also like super behind on all the stuff he was going to make. So. That's that's how regulation saves, you know, all of us. 
from mm. horrible foodborne illnesses and that that awful raw milk, you know, gonna kill us all. Oh yeah. It, that that they have to go and you know cost this guy probably a quarter million dollars. Well, there's uh, viruses that. in that raw milk, you see, and if mm-hmm. they get out into the population, uh, Anthony Fauci says they will wreak havoc on this planet. Worse than COVID. Mm. Worse than COVID. He actually said that. <laughs> told me to quote him. In the raw milk? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whatever, bro. <laughs> cow, cow viruses. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. Those, those really what, cows are great cow reservoir pox? species. <laughs> yeah. That happens all the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, cows, they're just genetically so close to humans that they they serve as a great, you know, host species for viruses. Well, I mean, you know, viruses can jump species to species. It happens all the time. They just got to get close enough. That's all. Yeah, you know, it went from a like bat to a market, pangolin yeah. to that weird, like, bear dog or what the, what was that? Raccoon dog. The bear, raccoon dog, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the humans, all in like two years. Without ever infecting any of the animals, actually. Right. Pretty cool. Or killing them. Yeah. Because we killed the animals. Or killing any of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then the virus is on, like, papayas and and deer and, like, plants and stuff. Yeah, it was you inside know, so- a can of Coke. It, that sneaky yeah. <laughs> virus. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm going to hide out in your soda cans. Oh, but, but guess what? Um, also, they said that we don't have to quarantine for five days anymore I saw if we that. get COVID. I saw that. Um, we can thank now God, treat like... the COOF <laughs> the same way that we treat the flu. Now, that's that's got to be progress, right? Yep. Like yep. That, and those, that means you know, those... that the shots are working, right? <laughs> yeah, the shots I have like a 20% <laughs> success rate every year. Yeah, it's awesome. It's totally not gambling like and, and shooting in the dark at oh. all. Yeah, that's that's the 21st century right there. But guess what? AI is going to solve all of our problems because oh, yeah. robots with mo- robots that have exactly the same information as humans are going to come to conclusions that are better, obviously, because they have, well, you know, a, a greater interest. <laughs> they can see things that that we can't, Maddie. You know that, right? Like they're like cats, right? Cat will like look up in the corner and there's you don't see anything there, but the cat knows there's something there. That's what robots are like. <laughs> they do do that. Uh, dogs do that too. Uh, what are they looking at? Really, like it's very. Uh, they're seeing. I don't know. It's I. Yeah. I don't know. But they're always looking up in the corners and like in this on the ceiling and stuff, and it kind of freaks me out. But then I have to remember that they're their brain is like this big and they are not very smart. But they are trainable. Uh, that is their one saving like, grace. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, 80%. Yeah, they will eat you if you die. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. They're yeah. good stewards like of the planet. Yeah. Nothing goes to waste. That's right. That's, right. that's <laughs> why I admire my feline friends. I'm also secretly afraid that they are actually the ruling species on this planet and that you have to be good to cats in order to get on to whatever the next level of this realm is. You know, that wouldn't surprise me because it's so easy to not like cats. Oh, no shit. You know? <laughs> like they're, they, they're like kind of disgusting. I mean, I get it. Like they're, they're cute and they purr and whatever, but like, like they also assholes. like cut you with their nails and then bite you for no reason, and then they tempt you just to punish you for it. Mm-hmm. Um, they also like meow at the worst times. They also like I don't know. They like to step on your keyboard and stuff. So like if that would be if there was like a test of human character, it would be liking cats. Yeah, because they're so unlikable. My point is proven. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. that. Not everybody can do it. What's what? What uh, uh, what's new with you? What's new with me? Uh, let's see. 
I made, uh, I found a great recipe for beef stew. I've made it twice now. It's fantastic. I'm still working on uh, getting the, the relationships with uh, local growers down here in Texas. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, there's, there's good things going on around here. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. We're kind of tucked back out of the way. Uh, nearest, well, the nearest major city, I guess you would say, is Beaumont, which is like a good hour. So it's, Sweet. yeah, it's kind of almost out in the middle of nowhere, almost Bayou country too, which is interesting. Cause I always wanted to live in Louisiana for a little while. So. Hmm. That's cool. Is it like, um, what's it like the climate there? Is it like plains or are there any fogs or what is it like? It, it's, it's kind of swampy. It's uh, pretty humid cool. most of the time. Um, but, you know, again, this compared to Acapulco, it's not really that much different. It's a little bit hmm. cooler. Yeah. And it gets colder because uh, hmm. I've, uh, I've already had to fix one broken pipe uh, since I bought the place. That uh. was a week in. That was fun. But yeah, it's not bad. Yeah, the the cold is good. Um, I think because things die, you know. At least they have to stop. Um, in the winter, so like at least you get a break from like the bugs and stuff. Living equatorially would kind of be difficult for me because there's no, there's no like reprieve from the insects and, mm. and all that. Um, and plus it makes growing stuff easier. And well, I'm not easier, but you get to grow a lot more things that you're used to, at least as an American. Because like you can't grow peaches if it doesn't get cold, because the trees have to undergo a certain number of chilling hours to to then start, you know produce peaches the next year. Stuff like no, that. but you can grow mangoes. Yeah. So yeah, that, I mean that's what I mean when it's like you can grow stuff. You know, there's nothing more American than like an apple pie or like a peach. You know, peach crumble. So if you like those things, then yeah, you'd want cold, but whatever. I know you can grow stuff in. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just, I loved Mexico because food literally fell out of the sky. It was the greatest thing ever. I've never seen anything like that in my life. And I used to live, I used to live literally right down the road from an apple orchard when I was mm-hmm. in Virginia growing up. But was it all like fruit? Uh, I mean, it's uh, mango trees, uh, coconuts, dates. Um, you know, just like all of the all the equatorial stuff. Yeah, just growing wild and free. Yeah, that's cool. I would get sick of fruit though. I think. Um, I read this book, uh, the Poisonwood Bible. It's about this family who goes to live in in Africa for a bit. Anyway, so like they were they were trying to teach them how to farm. Anyway, the point is there was food everywhere. Mm-hmm. But they were like but they, you know, really valued protein because that was much more rare. Um and I imagine, you know, living on at least I can't because I don't like sweets. So you know, fruit every day, I don't I don't know if I can do it. Mm-hmm. But, you know what would be cool is tamarind. Yeah. But I love sour. Tamarind's like, oh, that's like a that's like a warhead. Yeah. Well, I mean, there you could get sky. a lime pretty much anywhere. Yeah, 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 true. Yeah. Eh, yeah, apples, oranges. Well, the funny thing is I rediscovered my love for bananas uh when I was down in Mexico. Cuz I really I ate I ate bananas all the time when I was a kid. And then for most of my adult life, like I just didn't didn't really have much of a taste for fruit at all. But then, I mean, they they were so uh, plentiful down in Mexico, mm. and so cheap because they're so plentiful. It's like sure. all right, or like like your normal like Cavendish mm-hmm. uh, seedless bananas. Oh, yeah. cool. I mean, there's Did really only two grow? types left. Yeah. Huh. Well, you know. 
There was another one. I heard about it. Uh, it was the first. It's the first GMO banana. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. So I don't know how long, how many days the Cavendish has left. And now there will That's be only point. one, I think. One banana to rule them all. Great. Yeah. Uh, that'll make all the, you know, the all world the fans gets better happy. every day. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. It's called progress. That's why Joe <laughs> Biden is a progressive. He's making the world better every single day. Yeah. Make America better tomorrow. That's right. Now it's been all right. It, is it is it just me or does it seem like the parasite class is using the cover of the selection cycle to like shoehorn in all the stuff that they know people aren't going to go along with like the digital IDs and the CBDCs and, and all of that stuff. Like it's all starting to be like put into place from, from the beginning of the year up until now. And I don't expect that to abate anytime soon. But everybody's concerned mm -hmm. about, you know, their candidate and why their guy is better than the other guy. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, probably. I, I just, it's hard for me to believe that people fall for that kind of stuff anymore just because I'm so removed from it. But I, I guess they do. They do. Um, I think. But, you know, but the thing is, is I have faith in the kids. And I know it sounds stupid, but I think that. At least there's like a growing percentage of people in each successive generation that are becoming a little bit more clever. Maybe not smarter, but a little bit more clever because they have access to more information. And that sounds very cliche, but kids are spending like, I don't know, 100% of their time online. So you're going to eventually run into certain ideas. You know what I mean? And so this whole, I just, I just don't know if it's going to be possible for, for people to fall for it. So that's, in, in my opinion, um, we're going to be at, at like uh, probably in a war because this thing can't go on. You know what I mean? Like it just cannot go on this way because people are, are are becoming quick to it. Like, you know, the whole WEF summit, thing was all about trust right um caliph is uh, talking about trust everybody's talking about trust because nobody trusts the government less than i think less than 25 percent of the u.s population trusts the government at least according to a poll and i would say probably less than just, it's just like how they said uh 70 percent of the u.s <laughs> took, took the vaccines no they didn't right that's not true well, that's, uh, that's why we've been it. having all of this other horrible shit visited upon us, right? Because we didn't <laughs> take it in the numbers that they wanted. So right. now we, we get the other liquidation. Slip. Yeah. Yeah. No, and, uh, you know, it's great timing because we have an election and we're going to have a horrible recession. And we're also <clears throat> not going to be able to trust anything we don't see with our own eyes in person. Uh, and we're probably, I mean, there's two kind of semi international wars, at least, at least, at least semi intercontinental, mm -hmm. um, wars at the same time. And my bets are we get a new sort of, uh, super virus or something this year. Cause that would be perfect timing. I mean, really. And that would be a perfect excuse to really say, Hey guys, listen, <clears throat> We told you about the, the digital IDs before, and this time you're going to have to do it. Like, you're really going to have to. And, um, man, the Rockefeller Foundation, they, oh, man, where is this? They gave two and a half million dollars to the UN um, in order to accelerate the impact of the WHO hub for pandemic and epidemic intelligence by developing programs for genomics and climate health intelligence to help improve pandemic preparedness in the face of climate change. So, I mean, and that was last November. I wasn't aware that so anybody I, at the World Health Organization was intelligent. So this is news to me. Yeah. 
they're calling everything intelligent nowadays. Robots are intelligent. Oh, yeah. Computers are intelligent. Oh, smart. It's they're just, smart. Right. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're good tools. Um, they, they're but, good little, like, enforcers. You, you know, know what? That, that, is, that is an interesting uh, point to make, though. Because, yeah, when they're talking about AI, right, or they're talking about their algorithms or whatever, the stuff that they concoct, it's always uh, described as intelligent, right? Intelligent systems, artificial intelligence, all this stuff. But yet, when they're talking about the stuff that they're creating for us, it's smart. Smartphones, smart watches, smart cities, smart, smart cars, smart homes. Yeah. yeah. Right. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, it is. It's almost like, you know, if I'd say, uh, it's almost like it's smart enough to watch you. That's hmm. pro probably about it. Like it's smart. Like it's, a, it's, it's reporting. It's doing like a, rep there's a reporting function, yeah. like a re reporting cycle somewhere in there. Yeah. Like how cops are smart, but most of them aren't intelligent. Yeah. Yeah. Smart like a whip. Yeah. You know? Or the, the whip smarts you in the yeah. yeah more like the fascist literal definition of fascism <clears throat> um a lot, there's a there was a uh oh where did i see that it was on something like TechCrunch or something that uh at a university campus there was an m, &M you know vending machine a mars vending machine right and it like glitched out and uh the, some student took a picture of the display and it was saying that there was like a system error for the facial recognition software on the Mars vending machine. They're like, why is there facial recognition software on the Mars vending machine? It ha and in what world is that? Does that make any sense? Well, um, it's, it's so when, when you're coming up to, to get your uh, bag of, what is it? Uh, almond M&Ms or pistachio m&ms or but i don't know they just they literally just find nuts and and coat them in chocolate and poison and then stick them in the vending machine uh that's how m&m &M mars works people but i don't understand why people are upset that their vending machines have facial recognition when their self scans at the walmart have had facial recognition for years and I mean, they literally display it right there at checkout. Like there's a little video where you can watch yourself doing, scanning your, your stuff at the checkout. And that's had facial recognition for at least five years. Nobody's been up in arms about that. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's, it's like more conspicuous. So I guess like you're consenting. Um in a in an like an implied way, you know, because like you're going to Walmart, the Walmart's filled with video cameras, and then you go to the self checkout, and like you can clearly see the cameras. That's a little more conspicuous. But when like you're going to get a bag of M and M's, it seemed less necessary, like in a like a less justifiable way, because you're not gonna like you can't steal you know M and M's from a vending. You know, it's like there's no good reason. There's literally no good reason um for that so i think that's why they were a bit more upset to find that that they were and uh was this i believe it was in canada it, i might be mistaken it might have been in canada where at least like you have to give some amount of consent um but we're also talking about like potentially minors too you know so i don't know it just seems a little extra creepy over a bag of m ms you know like Walmart has a serious shoplifting problem, which I, you know, I can at least see, understand from a business perspective mm. why you'd want to make sure that people aren't stealing in order to stay in business. Oh, no, no, no. I wasn't talking about like those type of cameras. I'm talking about like in the, the little self-checkout register, there's a little camera mm -hmm. in the individual self-checkout and they even have the display there showing you what the camera is observing. So these aren't even the people that are stealing things. These are the people that are lawfully paying for whatever it is that they've gathered in their cart. It's hi. Yeah, yeah. Your own yeah, biometric you know, but camera. You know, but you know, you go to the self checkout, you scan one item, you throw two in the bag, you know, that's kind of <laughs> how that goes. <laughs> 
back when the self checkouts weren't smart. Oh, yeah. Because I only know that because uh first of all I haven't been to a Walmart and I have no idea how long, but like Good for you. Um one time I got accused of stealing from a Walmart and I remember it being so creepy and they like showed me scanning the thing and putting it into the bag, you know? It was like scan all items before putting them in the bag, you know, and it like flashed and like showed me doing the thing that I thought I was doing. Huh. So they definitely have AI like watching that because nobody, you know, nobody was like looking at that and then hmm. saying, oh, this person's stealing. No, it's like a machine because it was wrong. You know, a person's not going to get it that wrong. That's what I mean. And these are, this is what the, your, your health, <laughs> your health is in, in these the hands or non hands, you know, I mean, that's going to really roll out and, uh, it's, it's, yeah. And in, in anyway, well, I don't, I don't think most good. people have really taken the time to think through what a lot of the consequences are. Uh, like, for example, the automation that is taking place in the healthcare industry right now that is essentially removing the human element of the treatment process. That's, that's essentially what it's doing. In the future, when we go to seek treatment for whatever it is that ails us, we're going to be dealing with algorithms and we're going to be dealing with algorithms that aggregate symptoms. And based upon the symptoms that you tell the algorithm, it's going to give you a treatment option. That may or may not actually be anything that's going to be good for you or heal you or, you know, do anything to your benefit. It just depends on what the algorithm is going to spit back. Right, right. Um, but, you know, Caliph is all over this. He's going to make sure that the FDA you know, they get in touch with the people who are, you know, selling companies, these AIs, and they're going to be like, Hey guys, how do you think that we can regulate you so that you don't hurt millions and millions of people? Oh, because that works so say, well with the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, you know, uh, again, we're only making improvements upon the systems that we currently have. Yeah. So, you know, when you, when you, you know, you put you put lipstick on a pig, and it's you know a pig with lipstick on now. That's right. Needs some eyeshadow now. Right. Yeah, one step and at a time. Weirdly, it just becomes uglier. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm already to the point where I hope I never have to set foot in a hospital for the rest of my life. You know. I know. I know. I know. It's it's a literal hellscape. And that is very scary because a lot of people are born with, you know, problems that they, they in, in no, in no way did any of their choices lead them to where they are now. And then they're just like forced to go through this endless, very expensive gauntlet of incompetent people who just, they literally hear what the person's saying and then they, put whatever they hear into a computer and the computer says, do this. And that's all they're, that's all they're doing. Mm -hmm. Like that's their job. Now we don't have any doctors left. And imagine being in, in, in any amount of pain and having to also go do that and just have failure after failure after failure. I mean, people are just going to off themselves. I'm sorry, but that's just how it's going to go. Well, I mean, if you live in Canada, life the is government already hard. will offer it for you, you know? Yeah, and sub, and also concurrently at the same time, uh, they're, they're really trying to eliminate any alternatives mm -hmm. to what, it, what they're concocting. So it would be fine by me if that's the kind of socialized medicine they want to have, whatever, and but they allow everybody else to practice what they feel like is good medicine, but they don't do that. You could go to jail if you do that. So then you leave people up to their, it's just, it's, there's no winning. You know what I mean? Well, I think there is a way to win though. And I think that again, 
just like we learned back in 1983 uh, in the movie War Games, the only winning move is not to play. Don't play in their game. Build your own game. Sure. I agree. It's just difficult when you have, you know, it's even even Amish go to like allopathic hospitals and stuff for like life saving surgeries and or like, you know, somebody gets shot. Like you're not going to try to in reinvent anesthesia. You know what I mean? Right. So like in, in, in some from some scenarios, at least you are forced to play the game, which is really very tragic. Like that is really horrible. Yeah. That that's what that's the kind of stuff that I make because like I, I I'm not going to doctors dentists whatever I'm trying to take care of my own self but I know that if I get in a, like a car wreck and I tumble and I you know break my neck or my ribs or whatever I'm gonna have to go because mm. that's gonna be the only option. And that's that's what I mean is like if there were like a serious alternative where people are practicing medicine without like just with their heads like in the knowledge that they have and what they've learned caring for patients um i feel more comfortable with that but there isn't really an, any good alternatives because those are not those are a lot like um how uh the government is trying to get rid of cash to force us into cbdc's that's what they're doing with like actual doctors. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's just, it's really like it. That's, I don't, I don't really give a shit about people. You can go get a vet at like, I don't care about the choices that you make that are, are your own, but like it, it really makes me upset that in many ways, that's some people's only option. And then there's the costs and, and really, doctors are just so incompetent. They they have a really hard time solving very simple issues. I will say that, um, like, when I was younger, we had uh, a family practitioner that my mother would take us to. Like, when we, you know, uh, when we get sick or, you know, whatever. It was something she didn't know how to fix there was a guy in town who that's what he did. He had a practice, you know, he saw people treated their injuries, their ailments, whatever. And then of course, as time went by and the structure of health insurance changed, those family practitioners went away. You're absolutely right. We don't have that option anymore. We don't have, uh, you know, the family doctor, that either we go to see or he comes to see us because that used to be a thing in the United mm -hmm. States as well. You know, it wasn't that you went to see the doctor. It used to be the doctor came to see you. But all now that's I have gone. a proposal. I have a proposal that you might like. Well, just tell me what you think. Okay. So I would like that kind of doctor where he comes to see me. But not only that, I would like to pay him every month that I am in good health. And the moment I get sick or the moment I get ill, I stop paying him. And if he would like me to resume my payment to him, he must heal me. Otherwise, he gets no payments. It's like uh, health Actually, insurance, I like except that. it yeah. works. Right. It's a, it's a functional model of health insurance. Yeah, and you know you know who practiced that? Uh, the ancient Chinese. That's, really? That was their typical doctor is they had a doctor would have about four or five families he would take care of and they would pay him. And he had such incentive to keep them all healthy because the moment they get ill and, but you know, he would prescribe, listen, you have to do Tai Chi. You have to drink these teas. You have to do X, Y, Z. Um, Cause this will make you healthy. And the, the patients had good incentive to follow his directives. So it's just a win-win. But we don't have any more that anymore. We have like a serious lose lose problem, which is just the result of stupidity. That's it. And greed. There was greed yeah, in there. Yeah, well, as I well. mean, greed. I, I would call greed a, stu a stupid game to play because everybody loses um, in the end. Like, if you kill all the patients that you're stealing from, then, then what? You know what I mean? 
Like oh, you, you, you all are going to lose town. eventually. Yeah, you pack up your wagon and and you uh, you head out for uh, the next outpost. You sell your snake oil there. Yeah, exactly. But they uh, they want it. They they're really. I mean, oh man, we we are now entering a global health era, right? With the One Health yeah. um, model. So there's gonna there's not unfortunately a, a another another planet to kind of go to for them so it's just really it's really bad all around so i think you really should you know like work out and eat, eat well and have some fun and go to the doctor as little as possible i agree i think everyone should learn how to manage their own body mm -hmm. and it's it's not impossible you just mm -hmm. have to pay attention to what your body tells you yeah, that, and, you know, don't be afraid to, like, get books on anatomy and and read them and learn about yourself and stuff because it's just because you're not learning it at a university doesn't make it not real. Um, I, I learned that by getting a useless degree. <laughs> so. And what, for, uh, for, for folks who don't know, uh, what was your degree in, Maddie? Philosophy. And and how do you feel that degree has uh, has served you? I mean, of all the degrees I could have gotten, I feel like it it served me very well. Um, financially, you know, no, <laughs> but uh, quality of life and. Uh, quality of understanding myself and others and the world and and the cosmos um, a lot so you know it depends on what you value i guess so, so but did i, I not... didn't have to go to school to to, to learn that stuff hmm. the problem is i was taught that i couldn't learn unless i learned it from somebody who has a piece of paper that says they are the teacher of things you know what i mean right so did you not have your student loan debt wiped out by Joe Biden? Yeah, uh, no. Man, okay, that's, yeah, that's a whole, that's a whole other thing. There's no good answers to that. <laughs> um, I think universities should be abolished or should have the their tuition matched quality of their education. Um, I think that we should get rid of uh, public funding. And have actual, like, uh, what I would like to see is kind of like a, a sophist sort of schooling, make a reemergence re or like a, you know, a comeback where we have teachers who teach like certain skills or certain things on a kind of like on a traveling basis where they come by and you can learn, but actual stuff. And I like this, this stupid shit um, that is, you know, provided by your 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 local extension office from your university mm. you know that's like free for the public but like actual quality education where you can pay for it say like i want to pay five hundred dollars to learn how to weld um i think that people should should do that if they can teach how you how to weld they should go and teach it and i think that they would actually make a lot of money like i don't have to enroll in the curriculum I don't have to give you my social security number. <laughs> um, I don't have to have vaccinations. Um, I don't have to do any of that. I don't have to, I don't have to, you you don't give me a grade. Like I don't get a degree, but I learn how to do some things. And I think people would find success both in selling their knowledge, but in also acquiring it. I think you're probably right. But unfortunately, the system we have doesn't allow for that. So that would mean that we would need to either reform or replace the system entirely. Uh, I would opt for the latter. Just because, yeah, number do. one, it would free up a whole lot of funding for other things. 
I was listening to Pirate Wires, which is like this newer podcast. It's out of California by these like Silicon Valley types. Anyway, they're like they're like chill Silicon Valley types, though. They're like super red pilled. And um uh anyway, one of them, there's this girl on there, and she was talking she went to university for computer science or something, you know, in that vein. And at her school, which I think was Stanford, they made her sign an agreement to use the information that she was learning in school for the purposes of like uh helping the the like woke agenda basically like i will help uh you know establish equality amongst all peoples and and you know save the world from climate change and stuff like that um so now they're like really not even trying to hide the fact that they're like political uh establishments or wow. like a sort of like a training ground for for that whatever you mm. call that well i call it communism because that's <laughs> that's what it seems to be like the the whole woke movement seems to be nothing more than communism updated for the 21st century with you know some new bells and whistles because now we can if you want to be a man we can make you a woman and it in or yeah if you're a woman and you want to be a man we can make you one and if you're a man and you want to be a woman, we can make you one. Just don't ask, ask us to do it perfect and don't ask us to reverse it. Right? Right. 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 And also $25,000, please. Yes. Thank you. To get you started. What yeah. was it? I, and then you oh, probably are, you have a much higher likelihood of feeling yourself after. What is it? I heard, uh, I want to say is every uh, transgender person who goes through with their surgery, right? Which they consider a successful surgery. Uh, they end up spending somewhere in the neighborhood of like $8 million over the course of their lifetime for the surgeries, for the hormone treatments, for like just the whole kit and caboodle. Like if, if you want to change your gender physically, like you're going to, you're going to need money to do it. Because it is not cheap. You know what is cheaper? Having a kid. I think a kid costs like on average three million over really? like eighteen years. Wow. Yeah. So it's cheaper to have a kid than Multiple it is kids. to change your 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 physical. Yeah. In which you wow. potentially cannot have kids anymore. Correct. And then we have all these, you know, Gen Zers and millennials saying like, it's too expensive to have kids. That's why I'm not doing it. Hmm. Uh, but I mean, I guess, I, I mean, okay. So the government does like give you tax incentives to have kids, I guess. Kind of. But I feel like the rewards for doing a transition, like a gender transition are probably higher monetarily as I would bet. Like you're getting more of it covered either by insurance or by, you know, uh, whatever you call it, reimbursements. I don't know. It, I don't know, like state and, and federal reimbursements of some kind because you're like a discriminated now minority or whatever. Right. See, I always thought the purpose of the child tax credit was to trick people into filing their taxes. <laughs> no, I'm dead serious. I mean, probably. Like why, why else would they do that? That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I, I asked my father the same question. Who was a CPA? And he was like, shut up. I'm trying to work. True story. <laughs> um, I mean, they're definitely, uh, I mean, okay. So they encourage, they encourage certain people to have children and then give minor rewards to the people who are, are both having children and filing their taxes. But I would guess that with all of those combined, the, the incentives are, are very strong on one side, especially because you have like, you, you know, if you want a job, 
uh, jobs are now discriminating in favor of mm -hmm. trans people, gay people, black people, you know, so it, it like the, it, I mean, at least monetarily, it has like great incentive. So if you're one of those people who's like, everything I do, I do to have money to spend on, you know, whatever, then, then it would make sense, you know, fiscally mm. to transition. If you're a sports guy and you want to win more. Oh, yeah. Then that makes sense, yeah. you know. Of course. I mean, YOLO. It, yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> we live in the age of relative morality, right? We live in the age of relative everything. That's nothing true. has a, nothing has any. It's surprising to me that language still works in any way, you know, because anything can mean anything or nothing. And and language is bound up in, in meaning and definition and reference. So if one day, you know, computer means lamp and then the next day lamp means dog, um, it's hard to use language. So and, and then they're like messing with those boundaries all the time. Sorry. No, it it. I mean, that that describes exactly the situation that we find ourselves in. The only way that we can uh, actually come to agreement on things anymore is by doing the, you know, the simple work that we used to not have to do because we had heuristics, right? Mm -hmm. That we all agreed yeah. upon. But we don't have right. that anymore. So now we have to go back to the whole process of defining our terms to make sure that we're on the same page when, when we're using these specific words, we know what each other means. We have to do right. all of that again. It's a lot of inefficiency. That's a lot of friction and entropy yeah. introduced into a system that was working fine yeah. before. If it ain't fixed, break it. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Big H. Why uh, make anything easy? Yeah. Big H, you, you just have to, to jump in. Like we don't we don't have like like cuts or like you know, this twenty minutes we're gonna talk about this topic now. You just kinda jump in uh whenever there's a, a moment to do so. And we're usually pretty polite. Usually. Yeah. I mean you get sassy sometimes. I don't know. Yeah. It's a problem. I have a lot of pent up frustrations. I would imagine. What's you know uh, what's good for that? You know what's good for that? There's some honest backbreaking work. Oh yeah. Digging holes and moving dirt around. It will really like make you an honest and good person. Oh yeah. Hmm. Yeah. But hit let that sun hit you, sweat it out, you know. At the end of the day you're too exhausted to give a shit about anything else. That like is these true. I ha I am convinced that many of our problems are like luxury complaints. You know what I mean? Like it's you wouldn't be complaining about like certain things that we find super important right now, like uh, I don't know. I just I hear people complaining a lot about just bogus tiny stuff that like if you had that kind of complaint and it were a sort of like you need to make it through a certain hard time uh you would either not be having that complaint because you'd actually be going through something that's a lot more difficult and it would put things into perspective or people would like abandon you because mm -hmm. you're you're again you're introducing friction and entropy into a system that would function better without you you know what I mean? That's what I mean. Is if you like, if you move, I don't know, two yards of soil around, suddenly like that, you know, that chair, the chair that you wanted or whatever, it doesn't seem like that necessary or important or, or you know what I mean? 
like it just puts it it reduces the amount of relativity like it, it it's it or at least it like scoots the scale much more into like a, a real world less post-industrial consumerist society sort of scale where those those needs and desires and whatever they wouldn't even exist if it weren't for that backbreaking work that at least somebody's doing, right? Right. I don't know. I <clears throat> I I feel like I learned a lot of those lessons during my time in Mexico. Um, obviously, I'm not going to be arrogant enough to to say that I know that I learned those lessons and. You know, anybody else that uh, wants to challenge that, well, they're not sitting in the proper seat to be able to uh, to see that correctly uh, or whatever the hell Brett was saying earlier. Um, but there were, there were things I had to go without in Mexico because they weren't available or they were too difficult to obtain. Um, I had to uh, develop some new ways to do things because things that I now consider luxuries were not uh, present in Mexico, right? And I've had to do a little bit of that coming even back to the United States as well, right? Because even, even the internet service that I had at the last place I was at in Mexico was light years beyond what I have now. So explain that one away. But I think that's, I think that's kind of part of the whole experience of living in this world is understanding the, the deeper that you get into it, that the, the importance that you place on certain things is you know, not necessarily always aligned where it should be. Right. And that's kind of the, the, the whole point of the journey is to help you readjust those measurements. Yeah. I, all I'm saying is it, what you did was you moved into an extremely different environment than what you were in previously. Right. Mm hmm. Yes and no. Yes and no. Well, when for, so when you first moved to Mexico, that was probably super different, right? Mm, uh, well, yeah. Just mainly from the standpoint of uh, the uh, uh, difficulty factor on communication was like increased exponentially. Right. Maybe coming back, not as difficult? Well, no. But so like where I am now uh, in Texas is mm -hmm. nothing like any of the places I lived in Virginia necessarily. Sure. Um, although there like there are things um, about Jasper that remind me of Winchester, right? Because they're both small towns. Sure. Um, Would you say, well... Well, anyway, the the point is is that moving is already a difficult task. Mm -hmm. It's probably one of the most difficult tasks that people do on a on a semi regular ba basis. You know, at least it's like a it's not an atypical sort of thing to do. Um, and then you did it twice, and it was probably more difficult than what people typically experience. Well, I made anyway, it more difficult. The point yeah. is, yeah. the The point is is that you did a hard thing. And you did a hard thing twice. And I find that when people do hard things, um, they, uh, you feel like you can do uh, the easy things, obviously, but you find a sense of accomplishment, uh, confidence, capability in oneself. Uh, you realize that you can do hard things and you're probably more likely to do the hard thing again when it arises, right? When the mm. time arises again. So it's kind of like a self-rewarding thing. Anyway, so I think that people should do that more often. Like you should do hard stuff um, just because it's hard. 
and maybe maybe you get something out of it, but maybe you should just see if you can do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and we don't do a lot of hard things. Like going to school is not hard. University is not hard. Mm -mm. Maybe getting a job is, is a, a maybe you could say that that's hard, but it really isn't. I'd say uh, it depends on what you're doing for that job. Because most of the jobs that I had in my life, they weren't very hard. Yeah. But the, but people like what, what I'm saying is that people don't, it seems like it's, it's becoming more and more unlikely for somebody to like do a hard thing. You know, like there's, there are fewer of those hard things to do mm. uh, nowadays. So how do you know what you're, what you're capable of if you never test what you're capable of? You know what I mean? Right. Well, it's, I mean, and this is the, this is the, I don't want to sound too like, well, I guess, okay. So Tucker referenced Ted K on his podcast. So I'm going to re reference Ted K on his podcast, but I don't want to sound too like, I'm going to go build a cabin in the woods um, <laughs> or anything, but it does uh, it, the, the aggregation of these sorts of like soften softening, uh, feminizing sort of ways of life do have, an aggregate effect mm -hmm. and the aggregate effect is what we're we're experiencing yeah an apathetic population yeah apathetic population that is literally capable of or not not capable of nothing but has never is not ever done anything hard which life is hard and governing yeah. oneself is is very hard right like even just your own person and then in your family, doing that with your family is very difficult. Um, and now, you know, that's becoming rarer and rarer um, is to actually have a family. So, like, how can you expect anybody, anybody to be able to manage either like a company or a state or town or anything like that? And when they do, they suck at it because they don't know what they're doing. Because the same principle applies across the board. It's just a matter of scale. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's the main reason why we have, uh, well, it's obviously the reason why we have so much institutional decay in this country. But then you compound it with the fact that the people who could actually do something about it and try to get things steered back in the right direction they're not doing that and they're not doing that on purpose. Like they're the, the inmates have been allowed to run the asylum now and they're just waiting for it to, to burn to the ground so that they can collect yeah. the insurance money and start all over. Right. With, yeah. you know, better stuff, build back better. Yeah. I know. Like, it's really hard to accept the fact that they actually do want us all to die. You know what I mean? Like, that is that is difficult. But once you get over that, it does, everything makes sense. Yeah. It's very anti-life, anti-human. Uh, so, anyway. That's a, No, that's, that's a good way to look at it. Anti-human. I'm optimistic. Well, what are you optimistic about? What what is your uh, white pill? Uh that's a good question. I would say it's probably the things that I can do, and I know I can do them. So, for you know, for instance, my garden, uh, being a good person to the people around me, my family, and uh, uh, getting uh, gaining skills. In putting them into practice, that and uh, becoming more aware of my own values and becoming more uh, convicted in them and trying to propagate them into the future. That's what I can do. And that's what I think we ought to all feel at least obligated to do that much. It's hard to care about. <clears throat> It's really hard to care about more than that in a genuine way. Like you can be, you know, Will McCaskill and pretend to like care about everybody on the planet equally. Right. 
but that is to me a little bit sociopathic. I mean, he would literally have a baby burning in 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 a you know burning building. He let he'd allow a baby to burn mm. and st and save a Picasso painting instead. That is sociopathic, okay. But I think if you if you gain some perspective and understand what you are capable of doing, you're not capable of caring about everybody in the entire world. Well, well, um, but you are care capable of caring about everybody in your near proximity, your friends, your family, yourself. Um, and your, you know, your if you have property, um, caring for that and defending it. Um, if all, each of us in turn fulfills that role then a large portion of it will be a large portion of everything and everyone will be cared for so i wish that for myself and i wish that for others that is what that's my white pill it, and, and also just being in allowing others to just care that much like everybody now feels obligated to like care about you know uh a, a tiny country in the middle east that's doing the same thing they've been doing for the last 20 years you know in a in very intense emotionally that. exhaustive way you know what i mean yeah and they're doing that so much to the detriment of the people who are who are nearby who would who would benefit so much greatly so much more greatly from their care and attention than a tiny country in the Middle East. You know what I mean? Yep. <clears throat> You're sacrificing much for little is all. Um, and you shouldn't feel bad about doing what you can because ought implies can, right? You, you should take care of what you, you can take care of. That's true. And there's in in and in truth, and I know this is not what people like to hear, but in truth, we can only do so much. But we are many, you know. Well, I mean that that sounds a lot like uh, the principle that I try to operate under, which is you cannot change the world; you can only change yourself. But by changing yourself, you do therefore change the world. So it's just what you choose to focus on. Yeah. And in, in contrast, we have these people who are like really super obsessed with making the world a better place. Mm -hmm. And you see what kind of consequences occur due to that endeavor. And that, I mean, maybe they're true believers. Like I think at least half of them are thinking that they're making the world a better place. You think so? By building a print. But yeah, I think so. I don't think that many sociopaths exist. I think they're much, much more rare. Uh, like true, true sociopaths. I think people are really like, I think some people are just really stupid and mm. think that, they, that what they're doing is, is what they say they're doing, you know? So you think uh, you think Doctor Bill is is uh, he's just really not that bright? Well, I'm not talking about Bill. I'm talking about Bill's. You know, I don't know how many people he employs, but like many, many, many of them. Um, but the um, I mean, at least half of them. I would gander probably about eighty percent of them. The twenty percent of them, especially the ones that are going to be mm. super successful in philanthropy those probably have many orders of magnitude more characteristics that are typical of sociopaths than the rest so then and bill will probably score out the highest on all those skills hmm interesting so then which side do you think uh sam bankman freed falls on is he an uh, intelligent sociopath, or is he just a dumb pawn? 
Uh, he's not dumb. He's definitely not dumb. I think he's uh, uh, definitely a smart individual. And everything he did, he did on purpose. So I would have to guess that he's probably more like Bill and a bit of a sociopath. And I'll say that uh, the scenario, the economic scenario in which we find ourselves, and also the social scenario, is one that favors sociopathic tendencies. So the people who tend to do well score higher um, on those tests. And he did very well. So I wouldn't be surprised if he has uh, 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 at least extreme antisocial characteristics, which is, I think, is demonstrated and well known, um, but also sociopathic uh, tendencies. But I don't know. Um, I don't know him personally. I'm just working with limited information. He seems like a guy who, uh, he can do a, a mask. He can mask for a while, mm -hmm. but not for a long time. Because it's probably very difficult for him. And if you find yourself needing to mask in social situations, you're not, like, there's some sort of recursion happening. Like, you're pretending, right. you know? Right. You're right. playing a role. I don't you're not think being it's... genuine. Right. Yeah. I don't think I don't think it's the autism that he that he apparently has. I guess. Hmm. All of the references that I looked up on that, um, they just say early on, SBF was diagnosed with autism, but I don't know what early on means. And they don't specify like like it's not asperger's it's not um you know another form i've of... seen i've seen both i've seen asperger's i've seen autism or autism spectrum disorder right so. yeah well yeah. yeah usually they give you something a little more than just autism they don't say oh he just has autism like they've gotten more specialized than that with the diagnosis now. It just seems odd that they would just, oh, early on he had autism. We don't know which kind, just autism. Just garden variety. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, I don't know if he, see, the, the problem is, I don't know if he's been diagnosed, but I don't think that like the diagnosis is, you're like, you're allowed to know that due to HIPAA. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's not, if it's not self-disclosed. And he did disclose certain medications he was taking because he was applying to get those medications in court. Hmm. But as far as I know, there isn't like a, a medication you take for any form of autism. You know what I mean? Right. I I don't know. But uh, he was taking you know, antidepressant and Adderall. Okay. My question is, like, has he ever tried to exist as an adult without those medications? So you probably could do that. You probably could. Well, I'm sure he could. It Humans be, existed you know. for thousands of years without those medications. Yeah, it is possible. Yeah. And he might find it more enjoyable. He might find he has feelings. Like, you know, I don't know. Well, His doctors would not recommend it. <laughs> I'm sure they wouldn't. Not. His lawyers probably wouldn't recommend it either. <laughs> his lawyers would recommend that he just never open his mouth again. Right. And definitely <laughs> don't pose for any more photos. Good Lord. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. They think they, they like, oh, my God. The, uh, <laughs> the media with that photo just had so much fun. Like, it came out. So Tiffany Fong released the, the picture. Um, that she got from another one of the inmates. And they can all, apparently only take photos on Father's Day and Christmas or something like that. Um, and she was like, oh, yeah, you know, he, he grew a beard. Or, you know, he, 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 he changed his appearance by, like, growing a beard. And maybe he lost some weight. And then somebody else reported, like, hours later, it was like, SBF poses for a photo looking thin. And then, like, hours later, it was like, SBF picture looking gaunt oh lord yeah. and then later was like oh, yeah, SPF playing, uh, in photo looks emaciated 
<laughs> like the man looks like he might, you know, he looks at least healthy, yeah. maybe a little bit more than healthy weight. Mm. I don't know why everybody wants to like feel bad for him. Oh, he's only surviving on undercooked rice and a scoop of nasty beans. Well, because again, <laughs> that's that's what they're trying to to paint, right? They're trying to paint him as a sympathetic figure. So that when he ends up, uh, you know, basically getting a slap on the wrist at the end of all of this, you know, people aren't going to go ape shit and uh, riot in the streets over it because he stole billions of dollars. Do you want to place bets? Sentencing bets? And that's kind of where, where I was going to go with that. Like, you know, regardless of what condition he has and whatever his issues are, like, does that really give him a license to just blatantly take advantage of people and, you know, use their money for his own gains well, or his own purposes? There, so there's a lot more to it, actually, than just being like a money laundering operation, right? So a lot of the technology, apparently, that, that FTX was overseeing, from what I understand, uh, has direct tie-ins to things like Ripple and the interoperability of CBDCs. Like there, there were components of FTX that are uh, very important to the the new financial system that they are trying to put into place. And the best expl- explanation that I've heard of why it all imploded at the time that it did is that essentially this is an effort for the government to be able to come in and seize those assets from FTX that it wants to employ as part of the new financial structure. And once they've got that in place, then they're just going to discard the rest. So he's kind of just the fall guy. Yep. The patsy. He's the patsy. Well, it's, you guys know that that CZ got got too, right? Yes. Yeah. So like and they're now they're also they have, trying to take down Binance. Yeah, Binance and FTX are now both bankrupt companies, and both of their CEOs are going to go to prison. Mm-hmm. Those were the largest crypto exchanges globally. Yep. They made up I don't know how much of the market share, but like. It was a very large part of it. Uh, And they went down in 12 months of one another. Yeah, something like that. Maybe. Something like that, yeah. So that's a lot of infrastructure. Yeah, because the the Binance thing hasn't really shaken out yet. But Well, he did plead guilty, Mm -hmm. so uh, I don't know how you come back from that other than bankrupt and liquidate everything. But if I was a man who was in the market for, you know, uh, some some exchange infrastructure and I had a I didn't want to spend a lot of money, I would buy one of those at least, if not both. So that would be a really, really, really good investment. It just it's just it's really crazy that both of them, you know, went down around the same time. And are are just really cheap right now. It's just really it's a great time to be in the market for such a such an infrastructure. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Big H? Is it really a great time or is it just maybe I mean, what happens if there's no internet? None of this stuff works. Well, if there's no okay. If there's no internet, there must have been like an EMP or like some sort of CME, crazy CME or some, you know, magnetic reversal or something like that. And if that's the case, then there's like basically no civilization. So nothing really matters. Right. So I'll give it to you there. Like, sure. But in that case, we're, we're, you know, we're sharpening our spears that and whoever has the best spear, you know, is the smart man. Yeah, it, I can see them shutting down the internet as as we see it today, and then kind of bringing it back in a limited form, where it's very highly restricted in terms of what you can do on it. But I don't know. 
I can definitely uh-huh. see that happening. But the the fact that they want to to have the internet as the backbone of pretty much every human interaction going forward, I mean, when you really boil it down, that's that's what it comes down to. Uh, that tells me right there that there is no scenario where there is no internet in the future, as far as they're concerned, outside of cataclysm, right? There is going to be an internet in some form or fashion. And, you know, again, we're just going to be subject to whatever it is that they decide they want to do. It depends how much they try to lock down the internet, really. I mean, you know, they, they could prevent people from running their own servers, services, and, mm-hmm. you know, make it a real closed ecosystem where, you know, you can only get your content on Facebook or Fedbook, whatever you want to call it. Right. Um, well, I mean, they're, they're not quite to the point yet of taking down like individual websites at the DNS level. But as this, uh, the, the censorship campaign continues to roll out, uh, even just looking at their, at their own white papers, we know that that's, that's a part of the playbook for the future, right? They, they start small. They start at the things that they can control easily, like Facebook, like Twitter, like YouTube. And then they eventually get to the point where they're just, they're literally taking down websites so that, you know, the, the, uh, the registry still shows that there's a website with that address, but you can't get to it. It's just in limbo. Yeah, I, I think a takeover of DNS could be a very likely way of how they'll go at it. I mean, yeah. I don't know how else they would do it. I don't know if they'd. I don't know if they'd be taking down, you know, Coinbase and FTX. So they they'd definitely be leaving those up. Oh well, yeah. No, I'm talking about like. You know, they they decide that uh, something we said is uh, a violation of uh, the thought code uh, and we're now criminal and not allowed to be on the Internet. But yet I have a website, right, that that I pay for, like everything is is under my control, essentially, as far as as the website is concerned until we get to the hosting provider. They can go to my hosting provider and be like, no, this guy's got to go. What recourse do I have at that point? Are there any independent hosting providers? There are. I mean, you just need a whole bunch of GPU, right? Yeah. There are. I mean, it varies. Like, you know, there's hosting providers that claim to be, you know, more open to freedom than others but when it comes down to it all they have to do is shut off your internet access Mm -hmm. and you know they can block that at the isp level so like comcast for example could say okay we're not going to route traffic to this address and that would be really easy for them to do and i think some countries do that i mean And we also know that they have the ability to uh literally flip a switch at the region level um, not just at the individual platforms, but like, you know, for like if they wanted to, to shut off the Internet for uh, the country of Turkey. The, the ability exists for that to be done or if they want to shut off all the Internet in Canada or all the Internet in Mexico or God you forbid know, all the Internet in the United States. I, I agree that that uh, capability exists. My, my argument against that would be that I don't know if they would want to sacrifice that much like business that occurs on the internet um Mm. yeah there are like monopolies and all that but we're talking about like billions of dollars of of money changing hands in other kinds of businesses that the government also makes money off of so i think it would be disadvantageous for them to do that i'm not saying that they wouldn't and probably they would for like you know cataclysmic you know end of government scenarios where they, they find that they there's like a reason to do that, but it would be kind of like a, another, I mean, they did it with COVID though. Like they did shut down the economy basically. 
um, accepting for a certain like essential items, you know, like Walmarts and all that. Well, they transitioned so. the economy, right? They didn't exactly shut it down. Cause like you say, stores were still open. Fast food places were still cranking out their poison, right? You could still go to a big box store. You could even go to some of the smaller mom and pop stores that were brave. So they didn't exactly shut down the economy, but they did reshape it through a new set of behaviors that were introduced with sure. COVID. And yeah, I think sure. what, what they're trying to do is they're trying to force out all the smaller players, mm-hmm. make it so that only the, the big ones and the biggest can survive. And I think you're seeing that, you know, in the, in the banking industry where a lot of the smaller banks are going under and then getting sweetheart deals where they're acquired by, you know, the, the bigger banks, like the whole Silicon Valley stuff that happened last year. But I think they're trying to do that at all levels. You know, you're seeing all these mergers where companies are, you know, acquiring other companies and it's like, they, they want to force out the little guys so that only the big ones can survive because then they have less to try to control. So where does it end? I think, I think people though would, would in the end resort to hand to hand, uh, economies like not, not in the majority, but I think that, that would be a large i mean you just see it with anything that they ban so like guns drugs sex all that stuff there's like a very thriving black market economy for those sorts of things mm-hmm. so i wouldn't put, and put they a path control people those to too. still get what they need they, okay well they yeah i mean okay still i think people would engage in those economies at least right yeah. Well, I mean, regardless of their if of of who controls what. Government's not successful at banning anything ever, basically. <laughs> right. That's my point, is even if they tried to do that, I don't know how successful it would be. Well, we might be about to find out. That's that's the interesting point about living through this period in history. Like all the things that that governments had wished in the past that they had had the ability to do to their populations, all that stuff is possible now. Like <clears throat> they could literally be wiping out the entire population of this country right now with nobody being the wiser. You know the Z Big uh, Chatham House quote, right? Which one? It's easier to can to kill a million people than it is to control them. Yeah. In yeah. this day and age, yeah. Matter of fact, I saw that on Twitter earlier today, and I think I re- reposted it. Damn it! They've That's already got me to change my language. It's one of my favorite quotes, not because I agree with it, just because it's significantly a representation of what they believe. Yeah. Yeah, it's very Malthusian. It's, it, it amazes me that, that people don't recognize that more in their rhetoric. Like, it really does. Uh, I... I don't understand like the 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 White House press corps. Like I I don't understand those people at all. Like I don't I'm not sure that they're actually human because they don't they don't seem to to understand what they're actually witnessing, right? Remember they're kind of actors on a reality TV show really when it comes down to it. Yeah, I suppose you're right. But how much more absurd can we get in 2024? 
I mean, we already we already had uh, the the Tom McDonald and Ben Shapiro number one rap track, right? <laughs> Who had that on their bingo card? <laughs> what was it? He can't uh, say he hates rap anymore. That's right. He would be was, a self-hating, uh, you know. Oh, I, he'll find plenty of other reasons, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but even Yona last night made the bold prediction that uh, neither Orange Man Bad or uh, uh, Grandpa Shuffles will be <laughs> their uh, representative candidates on the ballots in November. Dude, I think he's right. Like, I really do. I think Trump will be assassinated and Joe Biden's just not going to make it. Like, he, he's not electable. I'm sorry. Like, no matter how you spin it, no matter how many votes magically appear in his ballot box, uh, he's either not going to make president, it. He's the most popular president in history, though. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> 81 million votes can't be wrong. Don't forget that prediction about the cyber attack that cancels the election. Just uh, saying. That was... Wait, who, who's that? Who had that prediction? I don't remember, but I'm pretty sure it was... That it was AI. I, was it AI? No, I think that was I me. I think that was my prediction. I think I made it last year, too. I think that there's a good chance that we're going to be under some sort of inter interstate, I mean, international, like, military for like i don't know coup or whatever yeah you know like that there's going to be like some sort of martial law i i don't know Funny that you say that that's like worst case scenario okay but i'm just throwing it out there as a possibility well i was i was actually thinking a little bit earlier today uh just with everything and this being an election year and you know how they're trying to get people all stirred up I would not be surprised if by the end of this year we have at least pockets of martial law around the country. Like maybe just like within some of the cities, you know, but the uh, the counties are, are pretty much still okay. Like I could see martial law being declared in like San Francisco tomorrow. I, uh, not a joke. Sure. I'm envisioning like, you know, it's it's too dangerous, you know, it's too dangerous to hold an election right now. So we're going to put it off until it's less dangerous. So in the meantime, we have like this pseudo president that's not really an elected president, but is a president for national security. So this is like a DOD elected president. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Not not like, oh, you know, the whoever's the the general running all the branches of the military. I don't know who that is, but he's not in charge, but like, it's just still Biden. Right. But he's there, but there's just no election right now. That's what I think is, is very likely. Cause I think it's going to be a cascade of problems up until October and October is going to be the breaking point. And then it's just going to be too dangerous to have people. Uh, casting ballots. Or whatever. Thing is, though, is that the who's president doesn't really affect people's daily lives really at all for the most part. It's a matter of can they get food? And as soon as they can't get food for two or three days, yeah, and if something happens, hours. That, that's yeah. what I'm saying. It'll <laughs> only take 72 hours. I, I know. I know. Go ahead. Sorry. No, that's exactly what it, that's what it's going to take for, you know, the shit to hit the fan, really, I think. And will they go there? Looks like they're trying to, in my, in my humble opinion. I think that's what we're trying to get to. Wouldn't disagree. All right. So we are at the two minute warning. Uh, we're about two minutes out from midnight on the East Coast. So, uh. Last word. 
grow food so you don't have to starve with all the other lemmings. Try to support your local farms if you can. Yeah, Amen. definitely support your local uh, growers for whatever, whatever you get from them. Or make stuff they might want to trade with you for. Absolutely. Yeah, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. There are all different kinds of currency in this world. Uh, it's not just your, your fiat paper money. It's not just your imaginary crypto coins. Uh, although we do take it all here at Liberty Radio. Uh, don't forget, you can always help us out at manufacturingreality.org forward slash provide hyphen value. Uh, we do thank everyone for joining us tonight for another edition of Open Lines and especially uh, massive gratitude to both Maddie and Big H for doing all of the heavy lifting this evening. Uh, it was fantastic, you guys. I enjoyed every minute of it. We're going to have to do it again sometime. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Just let me know. Absolutely. Always nice to commiserate. Honestly, the reason I didn't jump in sooner was just I was enjoying the conversation you guys were having. I didn't have much I disagreed with. So, <laughs> no, you don't always don't always have to disagree to jump in. That's uh, that's the beautiful beautiful thing about it. So we're just here to be human just, for however much it. longer we're allowed to do that. Amen. <laughs>